Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I'd firstly like to congratulate and thank the Honourable Member for East Worthing and Shoreham for putting forward his motion today and for securing this important debate. Today I want to set out the Labour Party's position on the genocide which is taking place in Xinjiang. According to all the available evidence we have, it is happening. And to also set out why we wholeheartedly support the motion that is before the House today. In a little over six months, the global spotlight will fall on Beijing as the city plays host to the 22 Winter Olympics. The Games should be a celebration of sporting achievement and a powerful symbol of our shared humanity. But next year's event will take place under a dark shadow. There is now an extensive and undeniable body of evidence pointing to the relentless state-sponsored persecution of the Uyghur Muslim minority in Xinjiang province. Mass detention of more than a million people, first-hand accounts of forced labor camps, enforced separation of children from parents, and harrowing reports of forced sterilization. We've heard first-hand testimonies from brave Uyghur women speaking out about their experiences. Important in-depth research from academic Adrian Zentz, which uses the Chinese government's own publicly available data on Xinjiang's population change. And who can forget the film shown to the former Chinese ambassador on the Andrew Marr show of shaven-headed, blindfolded Uyghur men being hoarded onto trains by Chinese officials at gunpoint. The evidence is both compelling and overwhelming. And until the Chinese government allows UN investigators full and unfettered access to Xinjiang to carry out their investigations, this is the evidence that we in this House and this government must use as the basis for our opinions and subsequent actions. In April, it was this evidence that led this House to determine that genocide was being committed against the Uyghur people, a matter upon which the benches opposite were shamefully instructed to abstain by the government. Now we're approaching the point at which a decision must be made regarding the Beijing Winter Olympics. There are some who would argue that politics and sport should not mix, but from NFL star Colin Kaepernick taking the knee to Marcus Rashford shaming the government into U-turning on free school meals, to the England football team's united stance against divisive dog whistle politics this week, we have seen that many issues do transcend the divide between sport and politics. And this is not a new phenomenon. We only need to look back to the 1980s when the sporting world played an integral role in piling pressure onto the South African government to end its racist apartheid agenda. Now, I'm not sure how honourable members on the benches opposite feel about this, given the position that then Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher took on the matter. But as a huge British and Irish Lions rugby fan, and as an internationalist, I still feel tremendously proud of the stance that the Lions took. Their refusal to tour South Africa through the, throughout the 1980s is irrefutable evidence of the power of sport to deliver progress and positive change. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, now is the moment to harness that lion spirit and to, and to send a clear message to the Chinese Communist Party that oppression and discrimination can never be tolerated. Today, Labour is calling for a political and diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Games, as set out in a letter from my honourable friends, the Shadow Foreign Secretary and Shadow Culture Secretary, to their opposite numbers on the 7th of July. The Olympic Games have, of course, become a symbol of our global interconnectedness, bringing together athletes from across the world to compete under the Olympic values of excellence, respect and friendship. At their best, they are a testament to sport's ability to bridge divisions of culture, language, geography and race. Yet while many sports people have chosen to use their platform to show solidarity or to amplify the message of causes and movements, it would be wrong to expect them to, to sacrifice years of hard work and dedication to make up for the inaction and failings of their government. Nor would calling for the a sporting boycott or calling for the cancellation of the 22 games be fair on the Chinese people, who are not responsible for the atrocities being committed by their government. We need to be absolutely clear that Britain stands in solidarity with the Chinese people against oppression, and that this solidarity can be strengthened by enhanced cultural understanding 
between Western and Chinese people and communities. And this is why a political and diplomatic boycott is without doubt the position that this government must adopt. Over the past year, along with international allies, the UK government has rightly supported calls from the United Nations for unfettered access to Xinjiang in order to conduct a full investigation into the treatment of the Uyghur. Yet, the, yet China has remained unmoved. Now that's not to say that the UK government's demands have been particularly strong. As so often is the case with this Conservative government, strong rhetoric is yet to be matched with meaningful action. And I'll come back to that in my questions to the Minister shortly. But on the assumption that access to Xinjiang will not be granted by the 14th of September, which is the start of the next United Nations General Assembly, Labour has made clear that no member of the royal family, no UK politician or no senior official should attend the Games, as we cannot expect those individuals to be put in a position where they are serving to legitimise attempts by the Chinese government to sports wash, to take the Honourable Lady's phrase, the genocide that is per being perpetrated against its own people. In short, sending royals or officials to, the Beijing, to Beijing in February would not be fair on those individuals, would not be right for our country, and would be a betrayal of the Uyghur people. Today's debate in Parliament is an opportunity for this House and Government to take a clear and unambiguous stance against the atrocities being committed by the Chinese Government by supporting today's motion. So I urge all on the benches opposite in so to act in support of this motion and to send a clear message about what kind of country we are, a nation that stands against genocide and for human rights. It is clear that the Conservative benches are divided on this issue, and I commend any honourable member opposite who takes a stand against the government's weak approach on China, which is rooted in the type of naivety and complacency that have epitomised the Conservative government's approach successive Conservative government's approach over the past decade, from the so-called golden era to the present day. So with this in mind, I have the following questions for the Minister. Does he think it is right that the Prime Minister is set to put members of the Royal Family and by, associ by association Her Majesty the Queen in the awkward and uncomfortable position of appearing to endorse a regime that is responsible for genocide? Why is the government doing all it can to avoid votes in Parliament on China? Is it because it recognises that it's on the wrong side of public opinion and on the wrong side of opinion in this House? What recent pressure has the government put on the Chinese government to allow UN investigators to enter Xinjiang province? Where are the Magnitsky sanctions on Chen Quanggo? It's been a full six months since the Foreign Secretary suppo supposedly announced, an urge a, announced a supposedly urgent review into export controls on UK products sold into Xinjiang. When will we be seeing that report? When will the government make genuine substantive legislative changes to the Modern Slavery Act that will toughen up supply chain due diligence? Will the Minister send a clear message that by the time of the next UN General Assembly meeting that China must not only have granted full and unfettered access for the UN to, to Xinjiang, but must also remove the entirely unjust sanctions that have been placed on members of this House and of the other place by the Chinese government? And will he take steps to ensure that China is not awarded the 2030 World Cup, bidding for which begins in June 2022? Mr Deputy Speaker, if global Britain is to mean anything, it should mean upholding our values and defending human rights, no matter where in the world they are under threat. For too long, the government has been naive, complacent and inconsistent in its approach to China. Today's debate should be a turning point that leads to actions, not words. To do otherwise would be to hand the Chinese government a proper, the propaganda coup that they crave, at the expense of our country's reputation and obligations. A genocide is taking place in Xinjiang. This government now has a choice. Is it going to look the other way and send senior representatives to Beijing in February, or is it going to take a stand and understand that sending those representatives would be a betrayal of our values? Mr Deputy Speaker, enough is enough. It is time to draw a line in the sand. We on these benches recognise this, and that is why we shall be supporting this motion today. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, 
uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And uh, can I start by congratulating my honourable friend, the member for East Worthing and uh, Shoreham, for securing this debate, um, which um, has had some passionate and a well thought through speeches uh, throughout the afternoon. I'm very grateful to all honourable members, right honourable members, for their contributions. And, and further on in my remarks, before I hand back to the honourable member, I will try and respond to as many of the points raised as possible. Um, but on the substantive issue of whether there should be a, a diplomatic boycott of the 2022 Winter Olympic Games, as I've made clear at this, this dispatch box um, a couple of weeks ago at oral questions, and as the Prime Minister has previously made clear, no decisions have yet been made about UK Government attendance at those Winter Olympics in Beijing. And uh, one or two members have mentioned that they wouldn't like to see the Games go ahead at all, and the participation, of course, of Team GB at the Olympics and Paralympics is a matter for the British Olympic Association and the British Paralympic Association. They operate independently of government, um, as is absolutely right, but this is also required by uh, International Olympic Committee regulations. Mr Deputy Speaker, this government has consistently been clear about the serious concerns we have about the human rights situation in Xinjiang. And, and in response, we have taken robust action, has been pointed out by uh, a number of honourable and right honourable members. We have led international efforts to hold China to account for the gross human violations in Xinjiang. We have imposed uh, sanctions on those responsible. We have announced a package of robust domestic measures to help ensure that no British organisations are complicit, including through their supply chains. And the Foreign Secretary has consistently raised our concerns directly with Chinese uh, State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi, most recently at the end of May. He has also, on the 22nd of March, announced asset freezes and travel bans under our global human rights sanctions regime. This was against four Chinese government officials and one entity who we believe are responsible for the gross human rights violations in Xinjiang. Mr Deputy Speaker, importantly, these measures were coordinated alongside sanctions from the United States, Canada and the European Union. I know the Honourable Member for Bath referenced that we should be union. I know the Honourable Member for Bath referenced that we should be working alongside the European Union. We have done, and that's why we've delivered those sanctions alongside the EU. The government that the international community will not turn a blind eye to such serious and systematic violations of basic human rights. So it speaks for itself that while 30 countries uh, were united in sanctioning those responsible for these violations, China's response was to retaliate against its critics, a number of whom are in the chamber today. As the Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary have made clear, China's attempts to silence those highlighting human rights violations at home and abroad, including um, their targeting of my right honourable and honourable friends and, and peers here in the UK is completely unwarranted and unacceptable. The freedom to speak out in opposition to human rights violations is fundamental and this government stands firm with all those who have been sanctioned, including um, my honourable friend, the member for East Worthing and Shoreham and other honourable and right honourable members. And on that uh, issue. I summoned China's uh, representative in the UK to the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office on the 26th of March, where I lodged this strong formal protest at the actions of China. The sanctions we imposed in relation to Xinjiang followed the Foreign Secretary's announcements on 12 January of a series of measures in respect of UK supply chains. These measures, which included a review of export controls, the introduction of financial penalties for organisations that fail to comply with their obligations under the Modern Slavery Act, and robust guidance to UK businesses on the risks faced by companies with links to Xinjiang will help ensure that no British organisations, um, government or private sector, uh, deliberately or inadvertently profit from 
uh, or contributing to human rights violations against the Uyghurs or other minorities. We've also consistently taken a leading international role in holding China to account, and we've used our diplomatic influence to raise the issue up the international agenda. Mr Deputy Speaker, on the 22nd of June, a global UK diplomatic effort helped deliver the support of 44 countries for a joint statement at the UN Human Rights Council. This underlied our shared concerns and called on China to grant unfettered access to the region for the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. The growing caucus of countries expressing concern about the situation in Xinjiang sends a powerful message about the breadth of international opinion. And this is uh, a caucus of international countries calling out China's actions, which has grown from 23 countries to 44 countries in just over a year. And it's a tribute. And I pay tribute to the UK's diplomatic leadership, um, including our network across the globe, uh, the Foreign Secretary's influence with his counterparts, um, and under our G7 presidency, both G7 leaders and foreign and development ministers registered strong concern about the situation in Xinjiang. We'll continue to work with partners across the world to build the international caucus of those willing to speak out against China's human rights violations and to increase the pressure on China to change its behaviour. So I'd like to turn to some of the points raised by honourable and right honourable members. In, the member for East Worthing and Shoreham, in his powerful and eloquent uh, speech, made a very, very strong case. I thought it was a little unfair on one of my heroes, Sir Paul McCartney, um, <laughs> when, when he sang at the uh, opening of the London uh, Games. Um, but he also, he also raised the uh, London uh, Games. Um, but he also, he also raised the uh, issue of uh, sanctions alongside the Honourable. Um, and it speaks volume, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that while we uh, join the international community in sanctioning those responsible for human rights abuses, the Chinese government sanctions its critics. So if, if Beijing wants to credibly rebut claims of human rights abuses in Xinjiang, it should allow the human UN High Commissioner for Human Rights full access to verify the truth. This is a point I note has been agreed with uh, by the Honourable Member for Aberavon. He also meant I will once. I'm just conscious I've got to get to you. I don't want to hold him very long because he's uh, in the last uh, part of his speech. But uh, um, I have, um, on two occasions in the last four weeks, with regards to slave labour chains and supply in uh, Xinjiang, on two occasions the Prime Minister has, from that dispatch box, said that the UK government has uh, import uh, sanctions, import controls on uh, those who are suspected of being uh, suppliers through that chain. I have asked a series of questions of both his and the Trade Department, and the one answer that comes back from the Trade Department is they have no uh, import controls and they have no plans to make any. Could you tell me what government policy is towards import controls? We're making uh, good progress. Our guidance uh, to businesses uh, is being updated. We've launched a regular programme of ministerial engagement with businesses and uh, trade bodies, but he will, he will understand that much of this work is incredibly uh, complex and it does require the introduction of new, it requires the new, in, new legislation and also coordination uh, with our international partners. The, the Honourable Member for East Worthing and Shoreham also raised um, the issue, as did the Member for Stockport and uh, Chingford and Wood Green, the issue of Tibet. We're deeply concerned uh, reports of coercive control, restrictions on freedom of religion or belief, labour transfer schemes in Tibet. Um, we've drawn attention to the human rights situation there, uh, including most recently in a ministerial statement uh, at the UN Human Rights Council. I'm going to be timed out, I'm afraid, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I had a number of uh, points uh, to respond to, Honourable Members. I want to thank all Honourable Members. If I could just raise the uh, Honourable Lady Member for Bath, uh, wonders whether we should go further and have a full boycott of the Games. Uh, we're clear that the participation of the national teams is a matter for the British Olympic Association and the Paralympic Association. She also mentioned the amendments to IOC Rule 50, forbidding a a athletes to protest. Uh, this again is a matter for the BOA and other national Olympic uh, committees to agree. Um, let me end, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, no decisions have yet been made 
uh, about ministerial travel to the Beijing Winter Olympics. Um, and if there is a division on this motion today, uh, the government will therefore abstain. But our approach to China remains clear-eyed and rooted in our values and our interests.